Hello and a warm welcome to Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church, organised by the Bishops' Conference of Scotland. I'm Matt Mead. I work for the Archdiocese of St Andrews and Edinburgh. We begin with a prayer from Bishop Hugh Gilbert of Aberdeen Diocese, who is President of the Bishops' Conference of Scotland. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path or partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Hugh. To introduce today's event, here is Archbishop Leo Cushley of St Andrews and Edinburgh. Thanks, Matt. My dear friends, hi there. I'm delighted to be able to say a few words of welcome and introduction on what is a unique occasion in the life of a local church in Scotland. We've never attempted anything like this, but then the next synod called by the Holy Father is likewise like nothing ever attempted before. In my time working in Rome and as a bishop, I've participated in two synods, the last one being in 2018, which was about young people in the church. During it, a term kept appearing in the draft final document that, although it wasn't entirely unfamiliar, had several different meanings, and it was a little unclear to some present just what was meant by the term, and the term in question was, of course, synodality. Since then, the term has become widely known and used, but it still needs a lot of unpacking. Meantime, the International Theological Commission, among others, have looked into the significance of the synod and of synodality, the strands of history and theology around it, how it has been understood in various times and places and even different churches and how it may serve us now. The Bishops' Conference of Scotland therefore thought it might be helpful to us all to take a serious look at the matter in order to help us with our preparations and to be able to fulfill the Holy Father's intentions of embracing this unique moment wholeheartedly for the good of the church that we love. As you know, the Holy Father wishes the Synod to be a listening Synod, open to everyone great and small. And I know that many people within and without the church have already begun to express their views about the church and its future. But as this is such an unusual exercise and an important opportunity, we wanted to gather together a few thoughtful men and women to look at the synodality and what it could mean for us all. Today we have speakers from across the English-speaking world, theologians in their own right, headed by His Eminence Cardinal Mario Grech, the General Secretary of the Synod of Bishops in Rome. Our speakers have been asked to prepare an in-depth paper, which we are publishing in the unabridged version. For this event, however, we have asked them to share with us a summary of their paper, to give us a flavour of their reflections, and to give us something that may prompt a few questions and comments among you later on in the meeting. Meantime, we turn to Cardinal Grech first to set the scene for us. Cardinal Grech has been given the onerous and important task of drawing together the synodal consultation and we are honoured to have him address us as we open our colloquium. Cardinal Gregg is formerly the Bishop of Gozo of Malta. And I remember meeting you back on the occasion of Pope Benedict's visit to Malta in 2010. Happy times. 
Your Eminence, you are most welcome here. And we ask you to take our warmest greetings back to the Holy Father and to assure him of our prayers for the success of the next synod. Thank you very much. Thanks, Archbishop Cushley. Okay, let's take a look at our schedule for today. We have four main speakers, Cardinal Mario Grech, Dr. Sarah Parvis, Sister Catherine Joseph Drost, and Dr. Ed Morgan. Their talks will be summaries of papers they have submitted specially for this event, as Archbishop Cushley explained, and you will find a link to these papers in the description box below this screen. We do appreciate that it's the weekend and not all of you will be able to stay for the entire event, so it will remain on YouTube and we'll put in chapters so you can quickly get to any part of the event that you want. At 4.10 there, we have a plenary session, which will be a discussion between all our participants. It will be led by Archbishop-elect of Glasgow, Bill Nolan, currently Bishop of Galloway. And we'd like you to contribute to that. If you have a question, please submit it to my email address, which will pop up on the screen. And that's matthew.meet at staned.org.uk. And you can tell us your name and where you're from as well. <coughs> Cardinal Mario Gregg is Secretary General of the Synod of Bishops. Pope Francis has asked him to work with him in helping the Catholic Church along a more synodal path guided by the Holy Spirit. He's from Gozo, a Maltese island, and was previously bishop there. And he's now based in Rome from where he joins us to present his thoughts on synodality. Welcome, Cardinal Craig. Good afternoon. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thanks, Archbishop Leo, for your introduction as well. Well, I remember that now in 20, when Pope Benedict uh, came to Malta. And now we are at the eve you now of another people visit because Francis will be coming uh, to our islands as well in April. Good, thank you for all you are doing to enhance and engage the people of God in this scene. It is really a moment of Kairos you now. It is the scene, it is. God's gift to the church and to the world. And therefore, it is really my pleasure to join you, to reflect with you on synodality as a style. This is a very important topic now because authentic synodality now cannot, cannot be reduced to individual events. And this is one of the great changes that Pope Francis is bringing about. The Synod is no, not an event, but is a process, obviously, a process with events. The adjective synodal does not mean the practice of convoking synods, but it's rather a style, a way, a way of living, a form of existence, that gives historical expression to an inner life, an energy, indeed a synergy, to which we give the name of communion. In fact, one of the themes now uh, of this synod is for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. To say that synodality is a question of style, means considering is as something that qualifies or should qualify the ordinaries of ecclesial life and not only the extraordinary nature of individual events. Certainly, a style naturally tends to be translated into structures, processes, events, but style, style is something broader more inclusive, more, so to say, totalizing. We could say that style is simply and radically a way of living. 
to speak of a synodal style then means becoming aware that the ecclesial renewal of which there is so much talk touches the depths of the church's experience and is not limited to interventions amounting to no more than ecclesiastical makeup. The term synodality implies not only indispensable reforms of various structures in the church, such as the Roman Curia, no? or of procedures, such as the way economic bodies control the functioning of the economy, but entails reforming the very identity of the ecclesiastical institution. Synodality is a very demanding term, which means sharing the same path, the same journey, which is not easy. It is not just a matter of getting busy, of multiplying meetings. It is a matter of breaking out of apathy and indifference. It is a matter of breaking out of the logic that it has always been done this way. Christopher Theobald recently has offered an accurate reflection on Christianity as a style. Modernity and postmodernity, he affirms, has brought about profound transformations, not only within the civil society, but also within the church. These changes have affected the very identity of the Christian and of the very form of Christianity. In Theobald's opinion, the contemporary human person has become particularly sensitive to the hermeneutical relationship between content and style. It is no longer only the content that matters, but also the style through which that content is conveyed, interpreted. But what is a style? And Theobald, who measures his reflection against the New Testament and the Second Vatican II and contemporary theology, describes style as the emblem of a particular way of inhabiting the world. We have no difficulty in implying this definition to synodality, which can and must become the typical, typically Christian way of inhabiting contemporary world, determining everything the church thinks, says, and does. Obviously, the set of traits that identify any style are never fixed. Therefore, we cannot reduce synodal style to a handbook of rules to be followed, to lists of procedures to be memorized. Style, even synodal style, is a way of being that is always combined with originality. Nevertheless, an authentically synodal style cannot lack some distinctive elements. And, and I'm going to underline three aspects. First, the common dignity of the baptized. The first aspect of a synodal style is the recognition of the common dignity of every Christian, the awareness of the equality that all baptized share in the diversity of gifts, roles, and functions. This common dignity constitutes an ontological equality because it is sacramental. It is in fact rooted in the baptismal priesthood of all the faithful, which confers on every believer, every believer, an objective, indispensable participation in the tria munera Christi. The crux of the matter lies in the ability of Christians to recognize themselves as brothers and sisters, marked by the same baptismal, chrismal seal, which makes all Christians protagonists, all Christians protagonists of ecclesial action. Christian initiation confers authority, subjectivity, rights and duties to be exercised for the good and the growth of the community. 
unfortunately, our communities are often far from this awareness because of a clerical conception that since the second half of the first millennium has relegated the simple baptize to a position of subordination with respect to ordained ministers. The shift toward the co-responsibility of baptized men and women requires commitment, discernment, patience, as well as the acquisition and recognition of skills in awareness of the gifts that the Holy Spirit has bestowed to each one for the common good. And these things call for intentional effort. The second element, the second aspect of synodal style consists in the ability to promote new approaches in the ordinary management of participatory processes within ecclesial life. It could happen that we are so entrenched in clericalist, paternalist regime that we fall victim to using the term synodal in a way that is entirely romantic and therefore devoid of effective practical juridical implications. We must avoid this temptation. Synodality requires that we assume congruous dialogical attitudes and that we initiate concrete collaborative processes. When Pope Francis in Evangelium Gaudium spoke of the conversion of the papacy, he said something very, very serious. In the logic of synodality, this conversion should cascade down to the entire church in renewed ways of conceiving, living the episcopate, presbyterian, and the lay life itself. The guideline for verifying whether and to what extent the synodal style is not limited to a vague idea, but informs the very experience of Christian communities could be an expression that Vatican II exclusively uses in reference to liturgical action, but that, that could also serve as a criterion for the entire practice of our communal life of faith, actuosa participatio. We remember the urgency with which the Ecumenical Council and insisted that the liturgical celebration be returned to the community of all the baptized after centuries of clericalism had dredged profound rupture between those who celebrated and those who simply attended the rite. Now, however, we realize that this same discourse can and must be extended to other areas of ecclesial life. Indeed, we ask ourselves, if all are included in the we of the liturgical prayer, are they not also enabled to say we together in the life of the church? In other words, our actuosa participatio in the liturgy must tend by its very nature to express itself in all areas of ecclesial mission. In so far as those who actively participate in the celebrations must be able to participate with an identical protagonism in proclamation and catechesis, as well in the decision-making processes themselves. We know that the liturgical assembly is not an undisciplined gathering in which everyone does everything. But like all assemblies, it is an ordered convocation in which God has entrusted to a few the specific task of presiding in service of the many who desire the worship of God. The very same can be said for the church's mission. In a synodal church, the involvement of the faithful in planning and deciding the church's mission must take into account 
the specific ministry of presiding over that planning and the deciding and trust it to the bishop. Everyone is a protagonist, but not everyone in the same way. This conviction that everyone is a protagonist will help us avoid the pitfall of transforming the necessary distinction of ordered function into an unjust exclusion or discrimination. If all the baptized are to be invited to greater participation in decision-making processes, pastors will be required to listen deeply to what the Holy Spirit stirs up even in the least of believers. Following this logic to its natural conclusion, we must also carefully consider how in certain circumstances, under certain conditions, the lay faithful might also be involved in the communion with their pastors in the moment of final deliberations. Our task today is to begin to initiate new dynamics to patiently endure their imprecision and to seek even more patiently their correction. Investing in formation is the only possible way to prepare a more sinful future. Formation calls for inventiveness, farsightedness, and resources. It calls for patience in taking short steps, even as we are aware that the path upon which we are embarked is quite long. The last element, third aspect of an authentic synodal style is the maturation of a synodal spirituality. I left this for the last because it constitutes the culmination of the entire discourse. Structures cannot be changed unless we first change the minds and hearts of those who inhabit are called to animate those structures. Synodality as a style demands interior conversion. The journey together that this style demands of us is first and foremost a spiritual journey made up of prayer, listening to the word of God, penitence, and fraternal charity. In the gospel, spirit of baptismal fraternity and the Eucharistic communion, synodality leads one to live, work, and generously, generously collaborate with all others. It gives life to a lived co-responsibility that is wise, serious, tenacious. Because each local church is unique, its synodal path will also be unique. This means that while there is no uniform blueprint for synodality, it is clear that the church's spiritual sense will give rise to a synodality that is in communion with the entirety of God's people and which will inspire and live in and govern Christian existence. Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal Greg. And Cardinal Greg's paper is titled Synodality as a Style, and it's available in the link in the description box below the screen. It is a question before we move on, Cardinal Greg. How, how are you finding this your key role uh, in the Synod um, with all the pressure in the world in, on a worldwide stage? Is it is it been quite difficult? Is it overwhelming? How do you cope? Not at all. And I tell you why, because I, I am not alone and I feel that I'm not alone. Because I am I'm confident that my brothers now in the Episcopate, you know, we are all on the same boat. And we have Peter, you know, Pope Francis at the helm. And the people of God in its nature, you know, is ready to cooperate and follow the call of Jesus through Peter. So this give me, gives me some sort of an assurance now. And yes, I'm, I'm a bit calm. <laughs> <laughs> Cardinal Greg, thank you very much for taking part in this Pleasure. event.
Dr. Sarah Parvis is a senior lecturer in early Christian history at the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh. Her research has meant she has been immersed in the rich history of the church. As we'll hear now, she will highlight synodality in scripture, in tradition, and in history. So can you hear me? Sorry, I'm getting two invitations to mute, unmute myself. So I want to make sure I'm not unmuting and then muting again. <laughs> we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, please do let me know if I go too fast, um, which I have a bit of a tendency to do. So thank you very much, first of all, to all of you, um, the, the bishops of Scotland, and um, also to, to you, Matt, and to Sister Miriam for this invitation. It's a pleasure and an honour to be asked to do this. It, it's really um, one, a wonderful opportunity for me because I love talking about, uh, about church history and about um, the things of, of the church and the things of history. And so um, I think it's very important that we include all of these when we look at synodality. I think it's not going to work if we don't look at synodality in history. When you invited me to talk on synodality in scripture and tradition and in history, I thought um, that's not at all a small topic. It's enormous, you could write a whole library on it. The International Theological Commission, um, as Cardinal Gregg has already said, has covered this in the first, in the first of its four chapters of the, the 2018 document, Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church. And sketched in there uh, a, a few of the key synods. Now, we could really talk about this for a long time because, of course, there are all sorts of different synods in church history. There are the great synods, the great councils. There are, um, there are obviously synodality in scripture itself. There are all sorts of particularly interesting local uh, councils, local synods. So I took three of these for a deep dive, if you like. And in fact, really, I only in the written paper, the published paper, I've, I've gone at some length into the first two. So synodality in scripture in the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts specifically. And then I've looked at the figure of St. Gregory Nazianzen after the Council of Constantinople as my second example um, of, of a, a particularly interesting example of tradition. Um, I said that I would take uh, as my third example, and I haven't really gone into this in the published paper at all, but it's something I would like us to look at, particularly in Scotland. The Synod of Birr in Ireland, in what's now County Offaly in 697, Adam Nunn's Synod, which brought in the Lex Innocentium, the law of the innocents, which invented the idea of non-combatants, of protecting not only women and children, but also clerics from violence in war. And I will say a few things about that at the end, because I think it's something that can inspire us in Scotland, particularly from our own synodal history, even though it's very um, disputed what exactly happened among historians. So I'll begin with a quick introduction and then present the conclusions of my written paper and then summarize the body of the paper very quickly, I hope, um, keeping nicely to time. So first of all, Jesus, which is what all of this is about, which is what we're all about, um, being disciples of Jesus. Synodality is, as far as I understand it, about the church's task of following Jesus as an institution. So discipleship is our task of following Jesus as individuals. And so in asking us to think about synodality, Pope Francis is asking us to think about a habit of thinking together as an institution, building up better a habit of following Jesus. So paradoxically, the word synod means a way taken together, which implies a dynamic movement. But in fact, synods, and certainly when you look at them in history, generally refer to a static moment when the church or a portion of it stopped and asked each other for directions because it wasn't clear which way followed Christ, the one who is the way. So synodality puts forward as a necessary habit of the church, the constant readiness to ask one another for directions with different degrees of formality and in different organizational contexts, 
if the way becomes unclear. Now, I think we need to recognize at the start that the way is going to lead to the cross. There is no other way it can lead. Um, there is no other way of following Jesus. It will lead to the death of every single one of us, um, and it will lead to failure and disappointment from time to time in all our lives, personally and collectively, as it always has in history. And this, when I was asked to write this paper, this was the thing I wanted most of all to stress. It's not cheap. It hurts. Synodality hurts. It, it will hurt individuals. It always has in history. And it, it, will, it will have consequences, just as Vatican II had consequences. And as everybody over a certain age has lived them and knows about them. So I think we need to look that in the eye and we need to be realistic about that. It's... Um, it's only going to be a sort of nice walk, stroll through the daisies in the park if we do it in a shallow way. If we really do it, if we really take it seriously, we really do it deeply. As, um, as religious and priests took Vatican II seriously and bishops, um, the consequences will be extremely disruptive and extremely uh, demanding. So um, I think we need to realize that. So now on to the conclusions of my deep dive into the three synods in scripture, tradition, and history. I might just note actually personally, uh, while I'm saying this, in case this seems an odd point to make about the, the pain of synodality, um, that I've talked endlessly about synodality with lots of friends, with lots of priest friends, with lots of lay friends, with my parents who are the Vatican II generation, if you like, with people in my church, um, with theologians, with Protestants, and um, I work in Church of Scotland, sort of seminary effectively, and with, um, with Episcopalians. And um, it's, it's something that everyone's very interested in and very excited about, but also somewhat apprehensive about. So onto the deep dive then. I mean, I think Acts is the perfect place to start for this, as everyone always does. The early synodal church community of Acts 1 to 15. Um, I think a deep look at this can give us a really good sense of how, the how synodality works in the church and can work in the church in practice. Now, I'm not a scripture scholar, I'm a, I'm a patristic scholar. Uh, so those of you, I know Sister Anna Maria is a scripture scholar. Those of you who um, who work more commonly within the norms of New Testament scholarship will be aware that I'm playing slightly fast and loose here, but I think in the uh, in the interests of tradition, this will be allowed. It's it's an ongoing debate. It's an ongoing debate I have with my Protestant colleagues. This the the historicity of Acts, how you're to interpret it. But I'm convinced that we have to take the historicity of Acts seriously um, if we're going to rethink and reassert the earliest tradition of the Church properly. So the initial community in Acts 1, 1 to 13, and before I talk about this, I might note um, that the first community, if you like, of, of people who, who gathered around Jesus after the resurrection were the women. And it's probably the case that they wanted to stay in Bethany. But Acts talks about moving from Bethany to Jerusalem, becoming an institution. The church became an institution right at the beginning. It made a decision not to sit around and talk um, and mourn Jesus or even talk about how wonderful he was in all the lives of those who'd known him, but to move forward. And the, the, um, the 12 apostles took this and they moved into Jerusalem. And this is what Acts, as you all know, says about the initial community. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, from Bethany. And when they reached the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying. There were Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. So the 11 remaining apostles. With one heart, all these were constantly persevering in prayer together with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Now, these groups already match three of the four pillars of the church that are spoken of by St. Irenaeus. And I would argue, when we look at the early synodal church, we're looking at a church that has four pillars. The four pillars are represented by the four gospels, but represented 
also by the four pillars mentioned in Paul's letter to the Galatians, in which Galatians um, 2, 7, 2, 1 to 10. In Galatians, you might remember, Paul goes up to Jerusalem and he meets those who seem to be pillars. And these are Peter, John, James, the brother of the Lord. And we consider Paul perhaps as the, as the fourth pillar, as Irenaeus would consider him. So we have these three pillars, first of all, already in Acts 1, 1 to 13. You have Jesus's brothers who can be considered as represent, especially his brother, James, James, the brother of the Lord, who can be considered as representing the Jewish Christian tradition, the tradition of Matthew's gospel. You have um, Peter, who's normally connected with Mark's gospel. And you have um, John among the rest of the apostles. Um, and you can sort of consider the women, I think, as going around him, because to my mind very much, John's gospel is, is the gospel of the women's tradition as well. But you have those three of the four traditions. You don't yet have Paul, but already you have an implicit disagreement in what following Christ means. And this, I mean, I won't talk about the, the historical side of this, um, but it means that, that the one of these groups, which is not going to last after the fall of Jerusalem in 70, is Jesus's brothers. So Jesus's brother James has a crucial role in early Christianity. He has a crucial role um, in Acts. He has a crucial role, particularly in Acts 15 in the Synod of Jerusalem. But he is going to die in 62. He will be stoned to death, as we know from um, Josephus, non-Christian writer, Jewish writer. And his mission will end in complete failure. But he is one of those pillars and the tradition of Jewish Christianity carries on in Matthew's gospel as being one of the four traditions of the church. So to these original three traditions, all people who knew Jesus in the flesh will be added a fourth, Paul, who didn't know Jesus in the flesh, who met him in the resurrection. And effectively, a lot of the early years, while Jerusalem is still standing, while the temple is still standing, will be a fight between these four different groups, if you like, um, with their different understandings of what the early church is. Now, all of that will be resolved on the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, when Peter, Paul, and, or before that in the 60s, when Peter, Paul, and um, James will all be killed. And then after that, the gospels will be written by the community that are trying to make sense of all this and probably acts written about the same time. So that early synodality is a synodality of different ways of interpreting who Jesus was, which eventually are only seen and understood after the deaths of their main protagonists. When the next community look around and understand, okay, so the temple's been destroyed. Okay, so the Jewish mission wasn't what they thought it was going to be, but um, they turn back. John's gospel, um, I would argue, particularly shows the community coming back to a self-understanding around Jesus, around the person of Jesus and understanding that the Logos, which they were to preach, the message is in fact the Logos, the word of God. Now, you can look through the, the bits of the community and I don't want to, to go on about this, obviously I don't have time, but um, Acts 1, 15 to 26, when Peter um, takes a decision to elect a 12th apostle, Acts 6, one to six, when the 12 call together the full gathering of disciples over the question of the widows, the Hellenistic widows that, um, who are not being included in the distribution of food. And um, then the gathering of Acts 15, 1 to 29, often described as the Council of Jerusalem, where James makes this extraordinarily generous response to Paul, where what may be the same incident that Paul describes in Galatians um, is described in Acts as the James who's about to die, whom everybody, all the readers of Acts would already knew had died in stone, but by stoning and, and um, in, in circumstances that are so difficult, they haven't come down to us. But that this James generously recognizes that in Paul, God is doing a new thing. And that the people of the synagogues of the diaspora 
could have followed the law anytime they wanted and they didn't. So it's all part of God's plan that Paul's way of starting a new people of God actually does follow the prophecy of Amos, actually does follow the scriptures. And James recognizes God at work in what Paul is doing, even though it's completely opposite to what James himself thinks the whole thing is about. So moving on from that, from the synodal acts of the apostles, where the early apostles, including the women, come to understand more about who they are, who Jesus is, what the church is supposed to be by suffering and by fighting, um, but as a consequence of their faith, hope, and charity. I wanted to pick up another character who comes up with something similar. St. Gregory of Nazianzen. I'm writing a book on the Council of Constantinople at the moment, so it's another one of these things I have far too many ideas about. But Gregory, uh, um, there's a particular poem that Gregory wrote on his life where you can follow everything that he says, everything that I refer to here in the longer paper. But I wanted to pick out something that he says in letter 130, and, and my apologies, your evidence for this, but I think this is something we have to actually look at as a, um, as a church. Gregory says in his letter 130, as for me, if I must write the truth, I flee all gatherings of bishops, because I have never seen a synod come to a good end, nor bring evils to a close, rather than augmenting them. Now, we might recognize immediately that Gregory's judgment here was premature, because in retrospect, we can see that he had, in fact, by his skillful, if inelegant, chairing of the Council of Constantinople of 381 the previous year, he wrote this in 382, including judicious extended use of diplomatic absence, steered it against all the odds towards bringing the ecclesially devastating 60-year Aryan controversy theologically and politically to an end. But Gregory was broken by all this. Um, he, what he writes after, he, he, he was effectively stabbed in the back by his own party. And um, it was very, very painful experience. He was trying to carry out what his great friend, St. Basil, who was already, Basil of Caesarea, who was already dead by this stage, wanted him to do. But it took everything that he had. And eventually he had to resign as Bishop of Constantinople after only having the job for a year and a half and sort of limp off to write the Eastern Theology of the Trinity, which he did and published that. So if you read his account of his own life, he thinks it's a complete disaster. And he thinks the synod in which he took part, the Council of Constantinople of 381 was a disaster. But in fact, we know that that's absolutely wrong, that it was great that the synod of Constantinople, which was reaffirmed in 450 by the Council of Chalcedon, was the great council which ended the Aryan controversy, became the second ecumenical council, became the council which um, affirmed the Holy Spirit, the full divinity of the Holy Spirit, and Gregory's own writings, his own five theological orations that he had written um, as the Bishop of Constantinople, when he was Bishop of Constantinople, became the Eastern theology of the Trinity and still is, and heavily influenced also Augustine and the Western theology of the Trinity. So I included Gregory, not only because I love him, but because I think we need to look at what he says about synods and look at, when I talk about the cost of it, look at um, specific synods in history and the way that they've worked in practice. If we're going to do a deep dive, we need to not, not take this from a shallow point of view, but recognize what this costs people. And finally, um, I wanted to mention the Synod of Beer in Ireland, as I did at the beginning, the Synod of 697, at which St. Adam Nan of Iona's Law of the Innocents, which protected women, children, and clergy from violence as a weapon of war, was enjoined on the men of Britain and Ireland as a perpetual law until doom. It was signed by 91 nobles, clerical and lay, although it was, um, the names all seem to come from Ireland, the ones that we know about. Obviously, Alan Nunn himself came from Iona. He was, um, he's the Scot of the first, if we can call him a Scot, um, of the first thousand years of the first millennium, the Scottish Christian about whom we know the most. We have lots of writings from him, um, together with his contemporary St. Bede of England, 
their their friendship and their work together shines a light on a, a quite dark period. That's why it's called the Dark Ages, um, the seventh century of Scottish history. But the light that we see, we know nothing about how he did it. We know nothing about how he got together these um, all these kings of Ireland, these bishops, and it's quite likely, although there's no um, record of this, that this would also have been promulgated in Scotland. Certainly he's from Scotland, across at least the areas that were um, Gaelic speaking, which was um, certainly the west of Scotland at this period. But this is an example to us. All that comes down to us is this law, which is still um, used. I'll, I'll show James Houlihan's book, talks about this and the importance of this in international law. The um, Alanon's Law of the Innocents is the first law we know of which says women, children and, and clerics, non-combatants in war must be protected. There's this great um, expression of jus in bello, the, the, um, the fact that you should treat innocent people who are not combatants um, justly. That, there's, that this is discussed a great deal more in Middle Irish literature, and um, there's a whole sort of story written around it of how he came across a battlefield and saw the head of a woman who had been cut in half um, while he was walking with his mother when he was a child. And whether this is true or not, it, it seem, cer sim certainly seems to be the case, James Houlihan makes this case, that such an effort as this was, and it can only have been an enormous effort, um, can only have come out of a great recognition of anguish and, and terror and terrorism. But um, that achievement was so great that although we see nothing of the synodal process that leads to it, we know, we still have the texts, it gets embedded in medieval Irish law, it gets divided, so it ends up being that there's a law of Patrick which protects the clerics and other non is understood as protecting women specifically. But you you have this whole tradition, which is not nearly well enough known in Scotland, although uh, work's been done on it in the last 30 years, which shows us how things can last. I mean, here we're talking about something lasting 13th centuries during some very, um, very dark times as far as history is concerned, and also as far as the humanity of human beings, the inhumanity of human beings to each other is concerned. So I wanted to give this, these three examples in my written talk, I say much more about them, of the way in which synodality can work in practice, the, the way that it works in people's lives um, and what it can achieve, what something like the Synod of Burr can achieve if you have a man like other man who has thought um, hard enough about what the need is and how you bring that out in practice. So, just to, to finish off, to come to my, um, my, my, come back to my first point, really. I've seen the Vatican II generation. You know, I often joke that most of my best friends are over 70, as my husband is. Um, I love the Vatican II generation. I, it pains me to see them. I think that the start of the synodal process has opened perhaps a, a, a hope, I don't know, I, I, I can't articulate this, but the, the young and the Vatican II generation, ideally they love each other when they're related to each other or they know each other, but they see things very, very differently. And the, the sort of, the necessary task of telling their stories to each other, um, is not going to be an easy one. I think I'll stop there. But um, that, was, that was certainly something that came to me out of the meeting that we had for the Edinburgh Deanery in the uh, Archdiocese and Cathedral, that um, the, the sheer difference of what the young think the church is, this generation for whom to be Christian at all is to be effectively an everyday martyr, um, to be thought weird, to be thought, um, to be drop out from society before you even start that what the world looks like to the young students is so different from what it looked like to my parents' generation where um, Christianity was normal and where religion was normal and where nobody thought this was strange. And 
just the need, the, the huge need, I think, for those two generations to look at each other, talk to each other, and understand why things look so different to each other. Understand, you know, why, if you like, singing uh, folky hymns in the 60s and, and um, having felt banners made sense to the Vatican II generation and why it so much doesn't to the current generation of students. Um, I, I think that's probably enough to be going on with, but thank you very much for-, for, well, for Thank you, Dr. Parvis. And Dr. Parvis's paper is titled Synodality in Scripture, in Tradition and in History. And it's available by clicking the link in the description box below this screen. Okay, we're bang on schedule, so let's take a wee break. We'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll see you shortly.
Welcome back to Synodality in the Life and Mission of the Church, brought to you by the Bishops' Conference of Scotland. If you've just joined us, you've missed talks from Cardinal Mario Craig and Dr Sarah Parvis, but don't worry, this session will be recorded and will remain on YouTube. Both their papers, which they submitted, are available in the description box below. Let's have a look at our schedule to see where we are. We'll shortly be joined by Sister Catherine Drost and followed by a response from Father Guy Mancini. If you would like to submit a question for our plenary session, which is at 10 past four, simply give me an email. And that is matthew.mead at stanhead.org.uk. Please keep your question brief. And also, we'd like to know where you're from. Sister Catherine Joseph Drost is a Dominican sister of the Congregation of St. Cecilia in Nashville, Tennessee. She's a professor of theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, also known as the Angelicum in Rome. Her interests include ecclesiology, with a particular emphasis on the role of religions and women in the church and the life of virtue. She's going to speak now on synodality and the mystical body of Christ. Excuse me, there we are. Thank you, Matt. And whoops, there you go. All right, you can hear me. Yes. Thank you, Matt. And also a thank you to the Bishops' Conference of Scotland um, for the kind invitation to participate in this important ecclesial event. Towards a theology of synodality. I've developed my talk this afternoon around a theological principle explained by John Henry Cardinal Newman. Newman argued that though a single truth of the faith in some sense stands by itself, each truth is also kept in order and harmony by other truths. Consider the example of the dogmatic teaching of Mary, Mother of God whereby we believe that Mary is the true mother of Jesus Christ. The church fathers could not have arrived at this definition without error if they did not also attend to the truths of one God, a trinity of persons, the hypostatic union, the nativity, etc. Our faith tells us that the Holy Spirit guides this process of development of dogmas and protects the totality of revelation across the millennia. Now, I'd like to apply this principle of Newman as to order and harmony to the current process of synodality. The synodal process in itself has been defined as the involvement and participation of the whole people of God in the life and mission of the church. But this journeying together, this single act in a way, is an ecclesial act governed by the Pope and bishops. Therefore, an authentic theology requires that the entire process of synodality be ordered in harmony with other ecclesiological principles. I would like to briefly address two of these principles, hierarchy, governance of the church by Pope and bishops, and census fide, a sense of the faith which belongs to all the faithful. The selection is not arbitrary and has already been hinted at and talked about earlier in some of the earlier talks. Errors regarding these two concepts are at the heart of contemporary polemics in the church because they're too often seen as contraries. Some impose a, impose a clerical reading of the church, on the church, excuse me, which emphasizes hierarchy and magisterium while ignoring or negating a true census fide of all the faithful. Others emphasize census fide to the detriment of ecclesial hierarchy which hints at laicism. Either position is dangerous and can cause fear and anxiety as the church moves forward in this synodal process, something that Dr. Parvis just made reference to. This process should rather be an opportunity for dialogue, 
catechesis and theological development. But this opportunity requires respect for the order and delicate harmony that exists between hierarchy and census fide. The first step towards harmony is a proper understanding of the church as people of God. Cardinal Grec already made reference to this, but I'd like to revisit it because it is important. As discussed in the second chapter of Lumen Gentium, the people of God is not a mass of individuals. Rather, each person is a member of the one church united to Christ as its head. Paul proclaimed this to the Christians at Corinth, the text selected for today's colloquium. Quote, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Paul identifies the church as the mystical body of Christ. The church is a communion of members, the people of God, called to into, into relation with him and with one another. Willing the holiness of all his people, God established first the old covenant, then through Christ and the Holy Spirit, the new people of God. The phrase synodal path, emphasizes the historical pilgrim nature of the people of God. We are all on a journey with Christ, who is the way, the path, the via. This image of the mystical body also highlights both unity and diversity, which respects the fundamental equality of each member of the church before God. Lumen Gentium reiterated this unity and equality of all members by first explicitly applying the phrase people of God equally to laity, religious, and clerics. And second, by affirming that all the people of God share a common dignity, a common vocation to perfection, one salvation, one hope, undivided charity, but not to the negation of the order and hierarchy. First, I'd like to go a little deeper into census fide. While discussing the people of God, Lumen Gentium introduced the concept census fide. It noted that through baptism, the entire people of God, from the bishops to the last of the faithful, participate in a census fide when they manifest universal consent in matters of faith and morals. Now, this is a complex um, discussion, and there's a document by the International Theological Commission, which I recommend that you, if you'd like further reading to address, to um, further information, uh, to read it. But the Catechism of the Catholic Church also addresses this point. And it says, census fide, by this doctrine, a Catholic, unfailingly adheres to the faith, penetrates it more deeply with right judgment and applies it to our daily life. Now, census fide is something of an indication or an instrument of the invaluable, ju infallible judgment of the church. John Henry Newman talks of this, but he also says it's not infallibility in itself. We'll discuss this a little bit more in a few in a moment. The question is, how do you identify? How does one know that there's something of census fide? I'd like to identify six characteristics. One, census fide includes, it's a testimony to apostolic teaching. It's always in accord with magisterium and tradition. Number two, it is a sort of an instinct. That's why it's difficult to grasp at times and to identify. It's something of the conscience of the mystical body of Christ. Number three, it's governed by the Holy Spirit. Again, that's why it's always in accord with scripture and tradition, because it's the Holy Spirit who guides this census fide. Number four, 
And this is important in this moment of synodality. It's an answer to the prayer of the church. Number five, back to this question of infallibility. It is infallible insofar as and because it flows from the theological virtue of faith. This is important. This does not mean that if I'm baptized, everything I believe participates in the infallibility of census fide. My participation in census fide grows proportionally with my virtue of faith and my holiness. Number six, in the words of Newman, census fide is irritated by error and expels it. The point would be that a Christian who really has this census fide is well formed in the church's teaching, will perceive disharmony, incoherence, or a contradiction in church teaching. They'll be able to distinguish between what's essential to the faith and something that may be accidental or indifferent. Now, these six points are important because they help us to avoid erroneous, counterfeit notions of census fide. I'd like to address two of these. Census fide cannot be understood as affirmation of an individual Christian's subjective belief. Example, if I claim that the Holy Spirit has told me that I have a vocation to the priesthood, that cannot be considered as infallible because this very notion contradicts an authoritative teaching of the church. Another error, census fide is not a democratic principle, a parliamentary vote, or any form of governance by majority or public opinion. If the majority in a parish, a diocese, or even in the universal church would claim that the church should allow divorce, a, allow a Catholic to divorce and remarry without any discussion of the indissolubility of marriage, the teaching on annulment, they could not properly claim census fide because this teaching would contradict scripture and tradition. Now, these are difficult situations and they're not rare today. They're complex and a source of great suffering. Bishops must be attentive like the good shepherd, listening to the bleeding of the sheep, but they need to try to discover and understand the cause of the suffering and complaining. Are the sheep lost? Are they in need of guidance? Are they stuck in error? Do they need teaching? Are they unable to extract themselves from the briars? Have they sensed a wolf lurking in the shadows? What about the hierarchy? Christ the good shepherd entrusted his flock to the apostles, to the bishops as their successors. The church is hierarchical by divine design. The bishop has authority. He is to administer to, to preach to, to sanctify his flock. Too often, all of us, clerics, religious, laity, see authority in the church from a secular perspective, as an authority of power. Properly understood, ecclesial authority is a service for the good of the whole body. How do we bring these together, the census fide and the hierarchy? Well, first, synodality definitely includes the hierarchy, but it extends beyond the authority of the Pope, the College of Bishops, and the Universal Synod. Even the Code of Canon Law, Canon 460, speaks of diocesan synods, which under the authority of the local bishop include priests, religious, members of institutes of consecrated life and lay faithful. And all of these offer assistance to the diocesan bishop for the good of the whole. Authentic theological discourse of synodality has to testify to a harmony 
a harmony between bishops and the faithful. This was present in the church at the beginning, as Dr. Parvis noted. Yves Congar made the statement that this collegial principle of the 12 apostles, which has this hierarchical order in union with Peter also includes a communal principle, a popular aspect of the entire assembly of the faithful. Newman argued that this popular aspect of all the faithful is distinct from the collegium but neither the collegial, the hierarchy, nor the faithful, the census fide, can oppose the communion of the entire church. That's why Newman made this, this statement. He said, the fathers of the church pass so easily from very strong hierarchical statements to communal statements and back again, because they understood this delicate harmony and this interplay. We have to renew this understanding today. Harmony is possible because both the hierarchy and census fide are instituted and authenticated by the divine truth entrusted to the church as a single deposit of the word of God. On the part of the faithful, a single truth of the faith isn't authenticated solely by my individual direct contact with Christ or the Holy Spirit. I have that, I need that contact with Christ, that union with Christ. But, but it is authenticated through the church. Christ gave us the church as a mediator of grace to confirm my faith. The magisterium entrusted with this word has an obligation to guard, to preach it. The magisterium though, isn't superior to the word. It's, it's, it is the servant of the word. Consider an example. Pius XI, when he was about to, de to define the declaration, the dogma on the Immaculate Conception, he conferred with the bishops of the world who expressed to him the single mind, not only of the bishops and clergy, but also of the religious and lay faithful. A century later, prior to declaring the assumption of the Blessed, Merger, Mer, Blessed Virgin, excuse me, Pius XII did the same thing. He asked all the bishops of the world to tell him about the faith of the clergy, the faith of the, of the people of the local church. And then he said, what? Almost unanimous response in conformity with the apostolic teaching and tradition moved him to make this solemn declaration under the spirit of truth. And therefore he could declare the dogma of the assumption that it was thoroughly rooted in the minds of the faithful. Hierarchy, census fide. Reciprocally, reciprocally, excuse me, these solemn declarations confirmed the census fide. They deepened the people's faith. So to summarize, tradition tells us what? Hierarchy and census fide are both authentic aspects of the church. Number two, there is no real opposition between them as to the faith. Only in the individual, our human element, is their opposition. And three, the Holy Spirit governs the dynamic interplay between the two. So to conclude, it's not by chance that many ecclesial documents end with a reference to the Blessed Virgin. This reference to Mary and her role in the church is also important in this first stage of the synodal path. Luke tells us that between the Ascension and Pentecost, the apostles were persevering with one mind in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. The church has always interpreted this moment and linked it not only with the preparation for the coming of the spirit, but with Pentecost itself and the birth of the church. Was this not a synodal moment? Here we see present both the Marian and Petrine dimensions of the church. The hierarchy formally rep represented by the apostles and the census fide modeled by Mary with the apostles. Here we find harmony, but also ordering. 
Mary is actively present with the apostles in prayer. And surely she joined in dialogue with them during the days leading up to Pentecost. Pope Benedict XVI went so far as to say that there is no church without Pentecost and there is no Pentecost without the Virgin Mary. But here there's also ordering. Mary was not an apostle. She was not a bishop. This harmony and order, unity and prayer, but distinction of roles present at the birth of the church is being lived out today by all of us on this synodal path. We pray for docility to the Holy Spirit for all the people of God. I would say here in Scotland or I'm here in Rome, so they're in Scotland, in the universal church, that the faithful may courageously speak and humbly listen to and accept the church's teaching but also that bishops will humbly listen to the faithful and courageously discern how to confirm and to pass on the teaching entrusted to them for the good of the flock. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Catherine. Sister's paper is titled Synodality and the Mystical Body of Christ and is available by clicking the link in the description box below. And I've updated your, sister pa your paper, Sister, as you requested. To respond to Sister Catherine's paper, I'd like to welcome Father Guy Mancini. He is a Benedictine monk of St. Meinrad Arch Abbey in Indiana, which he entered in 1972 before his ordination in 1977. He specialises in Christology and Ecclesiology. But I believe you're now based at Ave Maria University in Florida, is that correct? No, that's right. <laughs> Over to you. Good, thank you very much. Um, Sister Catherine Joseph has presented a comprehensive framework within which to understand what a renewal of ecclesial synodal practice might mean. She's given both the magisterial guidelines for such an understanding and has evoked one of the great names of the past century devoted to an understanding of the church, Yves Congar. She's also indicated uh, that the contemporary examination of synodality can easily be understood as a third step on the itinerary marked out by the considerations of papal infallibility at the first and Episcopal ecclesiality, uh, collegiality at the second Vatican councils. This is a, uh, that's, a that's a shrewd historical dogmatic observation uh, that she gives us to make, at least in the version of the paper that I first read. Uh, since she's also evoked the memory of Cardinal Newman, I want to build on that reference and further explore how the very exercise of synodality today may itself contribute to the development of doctrine. The point of departure for such an exploration is the nature of revelation and our apprehension of it. And I have to say just a brief word about that. The Constitution on Divine Revelation of the Council teaches us that revelation is accomplished by both deeds and words. It teaches also that revelation is in some sense to be considered closed. The closure of revelation, however, as one of the periti at the time of the Council indicated, must be well understood. The beginning of this understanding is the simple but fundamental observation that no deeds reveal anything to us unless they have been seen, and no words of revelation actually teach us anything until they have been heard. True it is, therefore, that we expect no new report of divine action and human response to contribute to the rule of faith, and we expect no new collection of divine words to be added to the canon of Scripture. But this does not gainsay the fact that the transaction of revelation, its completion as a successful communication of the divine mind and intention, the divine instruction and plan, cannot be understood apart from those who see the deeds and hear the words. Now, the hearers of the words and the beholders of the deeds form an as yet unended succession of generations of Catholic faithful. Moreover, every generation, has different eyes to see and different ears to hear the deeds and words 
The differences do not mean different things are seen and heard, but they are seen and heard differently. And this is one of the great engines of doctrinal development. The point is that the closure of Revelation is no proof against the historicity of its hearing generation to generation. And that's, I think, what we should expect today in this new exercise of synodality, that we should anticipate novelty. I anticipate it in two ways, and I'll share that briefly with you and end this response. According as the consultation of the faithful is comprehensive, which is to say Catholic, as to consulting all the faithful, and according as it is complete in the sense of inquiring across the board about issues doctrinal and moral, sacramental and practical, then I think we may expect two ways forward that will present themselves as a, as a development of doctrine. The first way will stand on the ground of Gaudium et Spes and the last council's invitation to engage the modern world. And in the West, the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom and Europe, to engage the liberal democratic and capitalist order that claims no more than a pragmatic political justification and which enables and supports every individual's right to construct his or her own moral universe. Dialogue with this order will contemporarily bear on the right to transgenderism and transgender rights, homosexual rights, and the older and more established Western democratic rights of birth control, abortion, and divorce. The justification for compromise, however, I think we should anticipate will take a properly theological form and so imply a development of doctrine. It might go as follows. It will be urged that the charity introduced into the world by Christ and his cross trumps the natural law and natural law considerations of ordered desire and love. This will mean, for instance, that restriction of access to the Blessed Sacrament to those who are not divorced and remarried, not homosexually active, although in a committed relationship and so on, it will be argued that that is arbitrary. It didn't used to be arbitrary when sexual roles were more determined in an agrarian context unto the common good, but that's no longer true. The introduction of the word made flesh into history, however, can sanctify modern and not only medieval history. For what is sanctified in the first and last place is the exercise of human freedom in the making of the human person. Well, so much for a first sketch, uh, the sketch of a first way forward. The second way will be distinguished from the first by viewing the continued dialogue with the modern world that Gaudium et Spes invites, invited us to in the 1960s. The second way will view that continued discussion as increasingly quixotic and pointless. And the second way will observe that insofar as dialogue means compromise, then there is no spoon long enough safely to sup with the exponents of the right of all to construct each one, his or her own moral universe. And the second way will also have a view of how to come to terms with transgenderism, homosexual rights, the softening and softening the ancient Christian stand against divorce, birth control, and even abortion. The terms that this second way will seek to establish, however, will be quite different from those of the first, but like the first will also try to suggest a properly theological move, a theological appeal as to how we are to live in a world structured by what proponents of the second way will style post and even anti-Christian moral norms. The theological justification for their settlement will argue for a tighter and tighter integration of what we used to think of simply as doctrines bearing only on the speculative order, incarnation, the real presence of Christ in the sacrament, the holy virginity of the mother of God, and integration of those things with traditional Christian moral norms. And it will be argued not simply that divorce and remarriage bar one from communion as a disciplinary matter, 
And insofar as one must be in a state of grace to receive communion worthily, but that the fact that they do so follows intrinsically from the nature of the sacrament. It will be argued that monogamy, not merely a serial monogamy, and marriage understood as necessarily and exclusively as a matter between a man and a woman, neither transgendered, follow strictly, not only from the natural law, but from the very doctrines already mentioned, incarnation, the real presence, the doctrine that Mary is the mother of God. For instance, because the sacrifice of the mass is a covenant meal, and because this covenant is the final and eternal covenant, it is itself indissoluble. And therefore it implies the indissolubility of what is also its other great sacramental sign, Christian marriage. The ancient Eucharistic discipline, therefore, it will be urged, is not just a discipline separable from the reality of the mass or a purely moral requirement, but rather something built into the sacrament itself. Or again, the incarnation and the divine motherhood of Mary mean that the assumed flesh and the womb in which it was nourished are both holy and holy precisely in their sexual determination. Just as such, the bodiliness and sexuality of both, of the Lord and of his mother, will become standards of how we are to live our bodily lives. The incommensurable and unsubstitutable roles of mother and son furthermore entail that these roles, and just in their distinction from one another, have a permanent value within the economy of salvation and the signifiers that communicate it. And just as the bodiliness of both was taken up from the first creation, the incarnation implies the ratification and not the relativization of this first creation. The moral prohibitions against transgenderism and the homosexual use of the body are therefore supernaturally confirmed, not supernaturally set aside. This second way will urge. The words spoken into history, a history of bodies and not just of freedoms, confirms the words spoken in the first creation. Grace elevates, but also presupposes and certainly does not destroy nature. Well, to sum up, whether the incarnation trumps the natural as naturally and traditionally understood within Catholic theology, first way, or whether the incarnation confirms it, in either way, I think there is in the offing an important uh, development of doctrine. Thank you. Thank you, Father Mancini from Florida. And also thanks to Sister Catherine Drost, who's coming to us from Rome. There's a lot to digest there. Again, you can look at Sister Catherine's paper uh, by clicking the link in the below description box. Okay, we're going to take a wee break now. We'll be back at 3.40, so you can get yourself a cup of tea, and then we'll hear from Dr. Ed Morgan. See you soon.
Welcome back, everyone, to this uh, online event for the Synodality. Let's remind ourselves of our schedule. This reminder that at 10 past four, we'll have our plenary session after Dr. Ed Morgan and Sister Anna Marie McQuan. If you would like to submit a question for our plenary session, please send me an email and please keep your question brief and you can tell us where you're from as well. Okay, Dr. Ed Morgan is a civil lawyer and holds a license and doctorate in canon law, the laws and principles of the church. He is a fellow of the University of Cardiff Centre for Law and Religion and visiting professor of canon law at the Catholic University in Louvain, Belgium. His paper offers an insight into what Pope Francis means by synodality while asking a key question. Properly understood, does synodality necessitate constitutional change in the church itself? Dr Morgan. Thank you and good afternoon. And may I begin? Uh, as the other speakers have, with an expression of gratitude to be invited to such an important event. It's a great privilege, whether I match the academic and intellectual uh, display that we've had already this afternoon is a different matter. Um, it's not for nothing that a number of the speakers this afternoon have already addressed different aspects of a core concept. And that core concept is the church as relationship. Relationship uh, relative to the mission of the church on the one hand and relationship between uh, all of the faithful and how we find our way identifying our means, our uh, authentic participation in the mission of the church with which um, Christ has entrusted each one of us in the universal call to holiness. But first of all, what do we mean by synodality? Uh, and there's been quite a lot of hype uh, quite a lot of media coverage is telling us what it is, what it isn't, uh, what it might be, what it should be. But in reality, uh, the most reliable term that I've identified so far is from Cardinal Well, where he suggests that what Pope Francis is inviting us to do is to um, re-engage with the energy of the Second Vatican Council. Others have been more elaborate, uh, more graphic, other commentators have suggested that it involves an invitation to press the reset button. Uh, others have expressed it as a form of invitation or exhortation for radical realignment of the church in a way that makes it more acceptable, more accommodating of modern day views, attitudes, or one might even say social mores. And that requires us, therefore, to pose two questions, really. The first is, what does Pope Francis mean when he speaks of synodality? And secondly, even so far as we are able to gain an understanding of that term, uh, is it necessary uh, for there to be constitutional um, change within the church to deliver on synodality? And um, for many people, the mere mention of law is enough to um, extinguish any enthusiasm and canon law is no exception in that regard. But it's important to say this, that fundamentally, in order to engage with synodality, we have to understand not just what synodality means, but what it represents for us here and now. And it has been described as journeying together. It has been described as being involved in a discourse, a preparedness to listen, a preparedness to express views, Discourse relies upon a common awareness or common vocabulary. There must be a receptivity, a reciprocity of vocabulary in order for us to be able to um, engage in meaningful dialogue that has the prospect of delivering an outcome which is for the common good. Uh, similarly, when we embark upon a journey, it's important to have answers to some certain fundamental questions. Why are we going on the journey? Uh, what route are we going to take? By mo what means will we travel? What's our intended place of de destination? What is our overall purpose? Those are the sort of questions that we would ask on a human level. And fundamentally, those are questions that we need to engage with 
when, in, when considering concepts of synodality and what it means uh, within the church. Um, importantly, however, in any journey, it's important to understand where we are now and also where we have been. Pope Francis's invitation is not uh, a suggestion that we should all become amnesiacs or forgetting our past, disregarding our tradition, disregarding our heritage. In fact, he's expressed matters rather differently. And if I begin, first of all, with a quotation from Cardinal Ratzinger, as he then was, the seat of faith is the memoria ecclesia, the memory of the church, the church as memory. And expressed slightly differently, the same sentiment from Pope Francis is, for there to be true history, there must be memory. A free people is a people that remembers, is able to draw upon its own history rather than deny it and learn its best lessons. So this is not an invitation from Pope Francis to, as it were, detach ourselves from all that has been before. It is, I suggest, an invitation to each and every member of the people of God to re-engage with the universal call to holiness and ask of themselves, what does this require of me in the light of the teachings of the church and the church's mission in the world? We have heard mention of communio and membership. Pope Paul VI was keen to observe that the notion of communio, which was used by the uh, council fathers, was not some vague feeling, but an organic reality that requires a legal form. And I mentioned that at this stage because for the purpose of posting or positing and responding to the questions that I have identified, I have suggested in the course of my own paper that what is necessary is to identify some preliminary coordinates or at least some mechanism or methodology by which to um, approach those questions. And I describe uh, what I have referred to as a hermeneutic compass as being provided by three documents. The first is the dogmatic constitution on the church Lumen Gentium. The second is the decree on the pastoral office of the bishops in Christus Dominus. And the third is the code of canon law uh, promulgated by Pope John Paul II in 1983 with the apostolic constitution, um, Sac uh, Sacra Disciplinia Legis. Now, why do we adopt those three documents as potential points of reference in configuring our journey? Well, that because they represent the expression or articulation of the church, its own understanding. And to go back to the sentiment expressed by Cardinal Whirl, the church's um, appreciation of the people of God and the mission of the church as expressed by the council fathers. What is important is that in, at the time of promulgating the code of canon law, Pope John Paul II said this, since the church is organized as a social and visible structure, it must also have norms in order that its hierarchical and organic structure be visible in order that the exercise of the functions divinely entrusted to it, especially that of sacred power and administration of the sacraments may be adequately organized in order that the mutual relations of the faithful may be regulated according to justice based on charity with the rights of individuals guaranteed and well-defined. Th these norms that we find in the code of canon law are intended to be the mechanism, the framework by which the rights of participation and the obligations of participation of the faithful, that is all of the faithful, enjoy some prospect of realization. And so, like um, a number of the other speakers, it's appropriate to um, mine these documents by reference to three uh, core elements of church understanding. Firstly, what do we mean by the church? 
Secondly, what we mean by the office of the or the um, authority of the episcopate, and thirdly, what we mean by the laity. And like Sister Catherine, I draw heavily upon uh, Lumen Gentium, and for present purposes, given the time constraints that we have, it's helpful to light upon paragraph 19. The common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood, though they differ in essence and not simply in degree, are nevertheless interrelated. Each in its own particular way shares in the one priesthood of Christ. Paragraph 11 of the same text says the sacred character and the organic structure of the priestly community are brought into effect by means of the sacraments. Incorporated into the church by baptism, the faithful are by their baptismal character given a place in the worship of the Christian religion. Just pausing there for a moment, it could not be clearer that what the council fathers are communicating is a fundamental recognition that the church is an organization, an institution, a community like no other, utterly without paradigm. And it's important that we recognize that in order to counter some of the dangers or guard against some of the risks that might be involved in a process of discussion uh, within synodality or any other form of colloquium. And that is the idea that the church is, like any other institution, susceptible to the importation of values which are inconsistent with its character or inconsistent with its purpose. And when we look at what the Council Fathers had to say with regard to membership of the church, we can see that they are talking about a membership designated by and configured to a sacramental relationship with Christ. Those same norms find expression, those same principles find expression within the code of canon law, canon 204. The Christian faithful are those who, inasmuch as they have been incorporated in Christ through baptism, have been constituted as the people of God. For this reason, made sharers in their own way in Christ's priestly, prophet, uh, prophetic, and royal function. They are called to exercise their mission, which God has entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world in accord with a condition proper to each. And the second limb of that canon reads, this church constituted and organized in this world as a society subsists in the Catholic church, governed by the successor of Peter, and the bishops in communion with him. That is um, picking up on a theme which Sister Catherine very helpfully emphasized, that what we are talking about is a harmony within the church, not a tension, not a contradiction, not an opposition, a harmony of um, relationships born of different contributions, particular contributions, uh, which are um, consistent with one's own calling, one's own vocation. But what about authority? Uh, picking up on the teachings of the Council, Canon 330 describes authority in this way. Just as by the Lord's decision, St. Peter and the other apostles constitute one college, so in a like manner, the Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter, and the bishops, the successors of the apostles, are united amongst themselves. And with regard to the particular churches, Canon 368 provides particular churches in which and from which the one and only Catholic Church exists are first of all dioceses to which, unless it is otherwise evident, are likened the territorial prelature and territorial abbacy. And as for the authority of the diocesan bishop, again, picking upon the teachings of the council, Canon 381 uh, describes it in this way. A diocesan bishop in the diocese entrusted to him has all ordinary, proper, and immediate power, which is required for the exercise of his pastoral function, except for cases which the law or decree of the Supreme Pontiff reserves to the Supreme Authority. So what can we draw uh, by way of conclusions from these sentiments expressed by the Council Fathers finding expression within the Code of Canon Law? 
First of all, as Sister Catherine pointed out, this is a structure which captures a complex reality without comparison. In the words of Pope Benedict, this is not a human association born from ideas or common interests, but a convocation of God. Founded by divine institution, the care of the people of God and its sacramental mission has been entrusted to the apostles and their successors. But what then of governance? Before we turn on to the question of governance, what does the sentiment I've just expressed, what does that mean for the identity and character of the church? Because His Eminence Cardinal Grec referred to the identity, the style, the movus vivendi of the church. Well, Pope Paul VI had something to say about that. The church has no other life but that which is given to her by her spouse and Lord. Indeed, precisely because Christ united her to himself in the mystery of redemption, the church must be firmly united with each human being. One can ask, therefore, has Pope Francis issued any statement or indicated any intention which is contrary to the principles which I have identified thus far? And the short answer to that is no. In the course of his book, uh, Let Us Dream, he states, like Guardini, I believe in objective truths and solid principles. I am grateful for the solidity of the church's tradition, the fruit of the centuries of shepherding humanity and of fides quirins intellectum, faith seeking reasoning and understanding. But what then of the episcopate? Uh, Lumen Gentium deals with the um, office and obligations of the bishop, and this is set out in the paper. But as far as the um, teachings of the church are concerned, it is clear that it is captured um, in Article 18 of Lumen Gentium. For the nourishment and continual growth of the people of God, Christ the Lord instituted a variety of mysteries which are directed to the good of the whole body. Ministers who are endowed with sacred power are at the service of their brothers and sisters, so that all who belong to the people of God are therefore enjoy real Christian dignity. This is the equality of vocation and dignity, which Sister Catherine spoke of earlier. And it continues, in the bishops, therefore, assisted by the priests, there is present in the midst of believers the Lord Jesus Christ, the supreme high priest. These shepherds chosen to nourish the Lord's flock are the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. What has been expressed in Lumen Gentium relative to the office of the bishop is clearly the pastoral uh, focus of that office and the duties which the bishop has towards uh, the faithful entrusted to him. But it's also right to say that Lumen Gentium communicates very clear legal duties upon the bishop. And Article 27 states, by virtue of this power, bishops have the sacred right and duty before the Lord of making laws for their subjects, of passing judgment upon them, and of directing everything that concerns the ordering of worship and the apostolate. And that same theological understanding is captured in Christ, uh, Christus Dominus, where it says the bishops also assigned to their position by the Holy Spirit, take the place of the apostles as pastors of souls, and together with the Supreme Pontiff and under his authority, are sent to carry out the never-ending work of Christ, the eternal pastor. Further in that decree, it states, as successors of the apostles, the bishops in the diocese entrusted to them possess as of right all ordinary power necessary for the exercise of their pastoral office. This power belongs to them as bishops and rests in their own hands. So what conclusion might we draw with regard to those sentiments? They are so central to our constitutional understanding of the church and so central to the um, analysis and theological exposition of the Council of Fathers that in Article 44 of that same decree, they stated this holy synod prescribes that in the revised code of canon law, appropriate laws should be drawn up in terms of the principles laid down in this decree. 
it follows that even those with a passing understanding of the code of canon law um, must recognize three matters. The first is that the bishop is in persona Christi in his own diocese. The second, that he is the steward of the common good. And the third, that all um, within the diocese, clergy, lay, religious, owe a duty of obedience to him. And likewise, that all within the diocese must recognize and engage with the authority of the bishop for the common good. And the common good must mean this, the authentic transmission of the church's teachings in a manner which fulfills the salvific mission entrusted to the church. As a person invested with the fullness of priesthood, the bishop is called to proclaim the gospel in and out of season. Similarly, in the exercise of his office, he is obliged to comply with the universal law of the church. Such compliance is a demonstration of communion with the Bishop of Rome and the College of Bishops. And it's on this account that this hierarchical relationship and the personal obligations to which he is subject, that the diocesan bishop is obliged to preserve the dignity, the integrity, and the authenticity of the church's mission from ideologies which might defeat rather than serve its purpose. So the question arises, has Pope Francis uttered any statements which might be seen to be contrary to that understanding? The answer to that is no. Uh, in the course of the same book, Let Us Dream, he states, the spirit always preserves the legitimate plurality of different groups and points of view, reconciling in their diversity. But he adds, I have wanted to develop this ancient process, not just for the sake of the church, but as a service to a humanity that is often locked in paralyzed disagreements. And later on, he stated, first, we need a respectful, mutual listening free of ideology and predetermined agendas. The aim is not to reach agreement by means of a contest between opposing positions, but journeying together. And it's my submission and my observation for consideration that what that journeying together means is engaging with and respecting the hierarchy of the church, which is part of Christ's gift to us. What then of the laity? We've already mentioned that the membership of the church is achieved through the sacraments of initiation. Paragraph 31 of Lumen Gentium defines the laity. And in the course of the text, paragraph 37, it says this, the laity have the right, as do all the faithful, to receive abundant help from the sacred pastors out of the spiritual goods of the church, especially the help provided by the word of God and the sacraments and they should make known to their pastors their needs and desires with that freedom and confidence which befits children of God and sisters and brothers in Christ. This statement of the council proceeded from an anthropological understanding of the character and dignity of every human being made in the image and likeness of God. What is important, however, is that whilst we find those rights and entitlements of participation expressed within the code of canon law, those rights are not free from responsibilities. That dignity of um, each individual member of the church instituted by the sacrament of baptism, aligned to Christ in the sac sacramental mission of the church, that dignity comes with responsibility. We're not here talking about rights which are those commonplace in other political ideologies. We're talking about a freedom and responsibility to participate in the life of the church in a manner which is consistent with the dignity which the church recognizes. And it's for that reason that the laity are recognized as having a freedom of participation. But it's also for that reason that we find in Canon 211 of the Code of Canon Law, all the Christian faithful have the duty and right to work so that the divine message of salvation <clears throat> more and more reaches all people in every age and in every land. What we have then through that swift examination of those three documents is a recognition that there is within the church both opportunity and responsibility. The great gift of, the, of this opportunity through synod is for us to, as in the words of Pope Francis, to reawaken our own 
sense of what it means to be church, to re-identify or re-excavate, in fact, the obligations that we have as laity, and to come to a more um, detailed, more informed understanding of the hierarchy that exists within the church and our role within it. I posited two questions. The first question, what does Pope Francis mean when he refers to synodality, um, is captured in this way. Pope's invitation is not an invitation to depart from teachings of the church. It may be considered an invitation for a church-wide dialogue. It is a dialogue which is intended to reawaken a sense of evangelization and mission, not simply in an institution, but within each individual who is a member of Christ faithful, a member of the people of God. And importantly, what Pope Francis has said is this, what is under discussion at synodal ga gatherings are not traditional truths of Christian doctrine. The synod is concerned mainly with how teaching can be lived and applied in the changing contexts of our time. Given that text, it may be suggested that Pope Francis is not, in fact, advocating a course which requires structural or constitutional change within the church. What he is calling all of us to do is to engage upon a path of learning, a reawakening, which facilitates informed participation and fulfillment of each vocation. As Sister Catherine indicated, this is a relationship of harmony and balance. In Lumen Gentium, the dignity and character of the laity was expressed in the clearest of terms. The Code of Canon Law confers upon the laity a freedom of action to cultivate their own apostolates. It might be thought that this opportunity had been overlooked and or too little developed. It suggested that the fulfillment of the lay vocation must necessarily involve the exploration of that potential in a manner which does not seek to erode or otherwise undermine the sacerdotal priesthood or the hierarchy within the church. Both remain Christ's gift to the church and irreplaceable parts of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. His paper titled Quo Vadis, Where Are You Going? is available by clicking the link in the description box below. To respond to Ed Morgan's paper, I'd like to welcome Sister Anna Marie McGuan. She is a religious sister of Mercy of Alma, Michigan, currently based at St. Andrew's Convent in Edinburgh. She's a scripture scholar and is catechetical advisor for the Archdiocese of St. Andrew's and Edinburgh. Let's hear from her now. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, Dr. Morgan, for your presentation and for your paper, which I actually really enjoyed reading. Um, the Synod on Synodality has provoked a variety of reactions in the faithful, as all of you know. And at the risk of oversimplifying those reactions, I would say that they basically fall into two camps. One where the Synod is viewed by suspicion and fear, and the other as uh, a moment of updating the church, updating that is being portrayed, at least, as an embrace of an autonomous humanity, a humanity that is no longer beholden to any will except its own, something along the lines of, we are the body of Christ, we are Christ, we are God. So without falling into either of those two reactions, the exposition provided by Dr. Morgan offers a reasoned framework for understanding what synodality is and how it might bear fruit in the church today. And for that reason, I find it very helpful. Um, the framework is quite straightforward. First, we have from the Second Vatican Council a very rich ecclesiology that unites the people of God without erasing the distinctions that exist between the church's various members. So those distinctions then translate into participation in the threefold office of Christ, priest, prophet, and king in various ways. In other words, participation looks different for a layperson than it does for a religious or a bishop. And then second, the ecclesiology received from Vatican II has been spelled out in more practical terms, we could say, in the code of canon law, which is incomprehensible if read outside the light of the council. However, taken with the teaching of the council, the code basically converts the images that we see in Lumen Gentium into identity, rights, and duties that are clearly delineated for the good of all. Therefore, it seems reasonable that if we want to understand synodality properly, we have to look at it in light of Vatican II 
and how the teachings of the council have been translated into law, and then how that law provides for the exercise of synodality among Christ's faithful. And Dr. Morgan has done that quite sufficiently, and I think has proven that despite some ambiguities in the church's discussion on the nature of synodality, it is actually something that could be quite useful for the church if done properly. That is, I think, the sticking point. What does properly mean? I think it means three things. If we are on a journey together, we need to know who we are, we need to know where we start, and we need to know where we want to go. The who we are is clearly answered by Dr. Morgan's paper, and it's been discussed already very much in this colloquium. Um, he also mentions the where we start, and that should be this kind of universal adherence to the church's teachings entrusted to the apostles and their successors for the sake of the salvation of souls. He writes, in fact, towards the end of his paper, it is in the interest of all within the church that fidelity to those same teachings of the council is recognized at the outset as the basis upon which dialogue must be predicated. I agree that if that is the case, then the dialogue that ensues will be both robust and productive. I do not think, however, that we can assume this starting point for two reasons. First, the church expressing herself both in Lumen Gentium and in the Code of Canon Law states clearly that the lay faithful, in accordance with the knowledge, competence, or authority that they possess, have the right and indeed sometimes the duty to make known their opinions on matters which concern the good of the church. And that's Lumen Gentium 37. So my question on this point would be, what is the basic knowledge that is possessed by the lay faithful about who they are, about what their role is in the church and in the world, and how they are meant to exercise their apostolate? Has the sensus fidei been nourished and built up by the Second Vatican Council after the Second Vatican Council? And I'm very grateful for the, the exposition that Sister Catherine Joseph gave on the sensus fidei, which I think really helps us to see this. My experience, both personally and as someone involved in the formation of the laity, tells me, uh, tells me no, that the, the census fidei has not really been built up and that the lay faithful don't really have a great grasp of who they are in the church. Is that type of formation desired by them? Absolutely. In other words, do they want to know who they are in the church? Do they want to know what the church is, who Jesus is, and on and on, without question. There is tremendous potential there, but it is largely untapped. The second reason that we can't presume a starting point that everyone knows and agrees with what the church teaches is simply that the way particular churches have been asked to conduct this diocesan phase of the synod seems to go against this. So I say that because we have been asked to include in these discussions those who, quote, have left the practice of the faith, people of other faith traditions, people of no religious belief, et cetera, end quote. So that's from the Vade Mecum, uh, to, uh, part two, point one. And it is, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's good that we have these sorts of discussions with people who have fallen away from their faith, who are, who are not Catholic. Um, I think those are very good conversations to have. But is the place for those discussions our diocesan synodal journey? Should not that discussion perhaps be a fruit of the synodal journey, a way for the church to re-engage in mission? Finally, just a brief look at the question of where we want to go. If we are on a journey together, that kind of seems unavoidable. Hence the title of Dr. Morgan's paper, Quo Bodies, where are we going, right? Where are you going? A particular church, if it does not answer this question, could remain trapped in a frustrating and fruitless series of conversations that seem to go nowhere. Yet the answers to the questions of where are we going in this synodal journey or why are we doing this as a church have been vague and illusory. It would seem that the obvious answer is that Jesus Christ is himself, the way, the truth, and the life. And so as a church, we want to journey together with him and towards our final end. And all our dialogue in some way should be oriented towards a more profound knowledge and love of him personally and as a community. But I think it's interesting to note that the name of Jesus does not feature in the 10 thematic nuclei proposed in the Vade Mecum for the Synod. He's not mentioned once. 
Listening is strongly emphasized, as it should be, but listening is also for the sake of a purpose. In the context of synodality, I would argue that that purpose is to foster conversion, a more authentic conformity to Christ in ourselves, and a willingness to accompany another on that same road of transformation. An honest synodal discussion would include, of course, looking at ways that we are not journeying together as a church, not fostering this growth and conversion. Dr. Morgan states at the end of his paper that the dignity and character of the laity have been clearly expressed by Lumen Gentium. However, the, the cultivation of the lay apostolate leaves something to be desired. I think that might be one possible fruit of the synod. I believe that this work needs to be done. And as a prelim, preliminary step, the education and formation of the laity requires renewed vigor and application so that they can carry out what they have a God-given right to do. And my hope is that this will be one of the major fruits of the synod. Thank you. Thanks, Sister Anna Marie. We now turn to our plenary session, which we'll have until half past, and it's a chance for today's participants to discuss some of the issues raised in the event so far, and for your questions which you kindly submitted to be asked. So if I can ask all participants to turn on their mics and their cameras. Uh, the session will be led by Archbishop-elect Bill Nolan of Galloway Diocese, who is um, going to become the obviously the Archbishop of Glasgow in about 20 so two a fortnight's time and there's a lovely wee interview i don't know if you can see it because <laughs> looks like i'm holding a magazine here but it's a lovely interview from the scottish catholic this week scottish catholic with bishop bill nolan uh, but we've put the questions in the chat but i don't know if you want to start with your own question and if i can just ask all participants just to keep your uh, answers fairly brief as we've just under 15 minutes over to you uh, bishop nolan yes thank you very much for that matt and what a wonderful uh, interesting discussion this afternoon so many uh, very important points have been raised regarding the Synod. Um, uh, my, my question I'd like to put is really mentioned is, is harmony. Harmony was mentioned several times by uh, our speakers uh, this afternoon. Uh, and yet there's a fear that this process is uh, going to lead to anything but harmony or division in the church uh, and going to uh, highlight those divisions in the church. So um, uh, there's, uh, my, my question actually fits in quite well with what a question here from Marion Pallister from Mark Gilpert, who says, what thought has been given to the thought that the process could alienate or even antagonise rather than bring about harmony? And one speaker talked about the possible pain of the journey. I think that was Sarah. And that can be expected as part of the very nature of our faith. But has a healing process been considered? So, um, uh, Sarah Palmer, would you like to start and answer that, perhaps, or, uh, about the, the harmony? Because you did bring up the, the question of the vagary of Nancy Ensign, who um, <laughs> didn't... Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I worry about this a lot. Um, I don't, I assume everybody does who takes it seriously. Um, I know a lot of priests that I know have really worried a lot about this. Um, I think that this is only going to work if we all pray a lot and we all love a lot and we all forgive a lot. Um, but, you know, th there's a lot of anger about in all sorts of different quarters. And I think that the Synod will probably bring this out. I, I mean, I've been involved in trying to do this in, in our own parish. And, and what I've tried to urge is we do need to go back to the doc documents of Vatican II. In fact, I would say Dei Verbum. Think about what revelation is. Think about who this God who's speaking to us is, what Christ means for us. And that if we focus really strongly on Christ and then listen for the Holy Spirit then I think you know and, and this is one reason why I'm so keen to just say it's it's going to be painful because I'm aware of just how big the differences are but if we're going to open this can of worms and I think it is a can of worms I think it's got to be written in that we're going to um, that we're going to have to forgive each other and we're going to have to do that by concentrating on Christ and um, we're going to have to have a lot of faith, hope, and charity. Okay. Well, yes, I think you're right. We have to do this in faith and charity as well. And we have to listen. Folks always say that we have to listen. Listen is 
really played a, a part in it. Um, another question here um, is about um, um, clericalism. Um, this question of Margaret Mary Morden in Glasgow. Uh, my question is, how do we reconcile what Cardinal Breck said in relation to clericalism and the need for radical change uh, with the emphasis from Sister Catherine to Ed Morden on the power of the hierarchy? So perhaps, uh, Sister Catherine, would you like to say something about that? Could you? Certainly. Um, one, we have to understand clericalism has many different forms. Clericalism is not only a problem of clerics, it's also a problem of the laity who put clerics, who don't understand and respect the office, um, put people on pedestals and don't understand the human nature, but we also need the grace. Now, as to the power, the question here is understanding the service, the authority of service. Now, having authority means I do have certain powers, obviously, but it's as, um, Dr. Morgan had noted as well, you have to understand um, what that role, what that authority is for and what the purpose is. So I don't see a problem. We Definitely clericalism, we need to fight against clericalism. Absolutely. And laicism as well. We have to avoid any extremes. But if we properly understand the hierarchy and its authority, which is of service, I need the church, I need the bishops to live out my faith, then we can move forward. But it does require, as Dr. Parvis said, faith, prayer, and I need to understand my own role and the role of the bishops. And Ed, would you like to comment on that as well? Yeah, um, I, I endorse everything that Sister Catherine has said, but my title just had this. Um, authority within the Code of Canon Law is expressed in the terms of competence. And the reason why authority is given is because there is a profound responsibility which attaches to the office of the individual um, who's discharging that duty. So it's not equipping somebody with the power of domination, it's giving them what they need in order to fulfill the nature of the office that they have been appointed to on our behalf. And I agree entirely that there, clericalism is often used in a pejorative way to capture that part of the clergy who appeared to have a superiority complex. If I can just speak openly about some of the sentiments that are expressed, or, you know, you're a lay person, you have nothing to contribute on this, that, that type of mentality. But there is equally a very real, uh, and you know, I wouldn't say universally present, but not, um, not uncommon phenomenon of the clergy seeing that the cultivation of their own apostolate, their own response to the universal call to holiness means emulating the priest or doing something like the priest or taking responsibilities away from the priest. And we have perhaps grossly neglected by catechesis, by evangelization, an, an opportunity to enliven office. In fact, the council documents talk about exercising that freedom. Uh, and But that's a freedom which gives them a freedom of action to fulfill in a unique way, in their own particular way, the mission that Christ has for them. And I don't see any tension between the, what I have just said with what Cardinal Grech expressed earlier. Um, clericalism is something to be countered. Uh, ultimately, what we're talking about is a collaborative relationship founded upon honesty, but also upon an informed understanding of what the church requires of each individual within it. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, I, I felt that uh, um, Cardinal Gnett was very positive in his presentation of the Synod and what was going to happen. But some of the other speakers maybe perhaps were trying to, um, to tone down some of the expectations some people might have, erroneous expectations possibly. And um, I wonder, well, John Keane here, John, would, would you like to, I'll try to comment on, on that or on the other points we've raised so far? That question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, just to say, as you know, uh, we had a diocesan synod in Paisley Diocese, and um, a number of uh, these issues were there or thereabouts in our synod in 2016, but it, it was, in the end, a, a really positive experience, uh, it, not without tension, but it was positive. I think it required 
honestly generosity on the part of the clergy. I think um, I, they were, uh, I think it's an anxiety within the clergy about uh, in the process of synodality, but uh, we, we discussed uh, the, the, having a synod with them and in the end, uh, with generosity, they said, yes, go ahead. It's with our endorsement. And then um, when it came to the, to the lay faithful, obviously it was a diocesan synod, and one of, the, uh, one of the, the points we made is that there wasn't anything at any point in discussing matters above our pay grade. What was the point of discussing matters that we couldn't change? And so at the diocesan level, let's look at things where we can change. And, and I think the lay faithful took that on board. They, they, they focused on, on lighting a candle rather than cursing the dark. Um, and in the end, I think what came from that process was there was honesty, transparency, perisha. Um, there was a lot of chaos at the beginning because everything that could be raised was raised, but it all s sort of came together and gave us a way, a way forward. Um, I, I think the challenge is um, to translate the synod enthusiasm into action and then to say, well, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to us, how do we then take this forward? How do we act on it, as, as Ed was saying? How do we then act on what the Holy Spirit has said? And, and I think that will be a challenge after the Synod. The Synod will, the, the Spirit will speak through the Synod, but, but I, I think it needs grace, prayer, grace. Um, the transformation, the conversion of the interior life, ongoing, the, the Semper Reformanda, to continue to, to put what the Holy Spirit says um, into, into mission. We have time for around one more question, uh, Bishop Nolan, just to let you know, so we're sticking to schedule. Okay, well, there's a question here from Francis Edwards in Orkney, um, and he asks, can a community that has no resident priest meet synod synodal conversation? How do we live out synodality without a priest? And perhaps, uh, uh, Sister Anna-Marie, you might want to say something like that, if you don't mind. Be happy to. The answer to that is yes, yes, of course you can. Um, ideally, of course, we would want to have the participation of priests in any kind of synodal discussion, but that's not always possible. So in that case, I think it's a matter of organizing yourselves and finding a, a way, a, a, either a place where you can meet together. And then also what topics do you want to discuss? What is of concern to the community and how can we Again, always keeping a focus on this listening. How can we have the discussion in such a way that disagreements are allowed and uh, they're not squashed and that we can, in a certain sense, is hold this tension in a higher plane. And so that it go back to that emphasis on faith, hope, and charity to be able to listen to one another and to be able to accept another's point of view without necessarily imposing on the other what I think they should think. That's, uh, that's very important in this because out of that openness, we can, we can foster this kind of new way of, of seeing the truth together. The point is to come to a greater truth that none of us possesses entirely, but that we're all moving towards together. So ideally, yes, you would want to have a priest, but if that's not possible, absolutely, please have, please have one of these conversations where the community comes together and begins to really pray together and think together about what is so important for the church today. Thank you, Sister Andrew. Did anyone else like to come in and ask before we end? If not heard from Archbishop Leo Cushley for a while. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, happy to chat. <clears throat> We've already had uh, most of our uh, deanery level discussions um, on, on the, the, the consultation on the Senate map. And um, speaking to uh, Father John Deegan and Sister Anna Marie, who have been in the lead while we've been listening to people and what they've got to say, one of the things, uh, there are two things that seem to be recurring themes coming through already. Um, and they've been, they've been sort of touched on here. But I think they're, they're worth hearing about already are the people who came found it to be a very good experience. That was the first thing. I think many people were very nervous about coming. I think some people came with very negative um, expectations. I only have that from one person, but there could have been others that felt that way too. But they all seem to have left, from what I've picked up so far, it's anecdotal, 
um, a good experience, a positive experience, and a listening experience with each other. But the two things that seem to be already starting to emerge um, are a concern for our, our schools, which I found interesting, and a concern for our young people, not just the schools, but our, our young adults. And in other words, a concern for the future. In other words, how we pass on our faith to the next generation. Because as we look around the world right now, it doesn't look like a world that is going to welcome the Christian message um, with, with the, same, the same openness that it did when I was a lad, when I was young. The world has changed quite a lot, at least our part of the world. And these seem to be at least some of the, the, the concerns that have emerged uh, with a view to the Senate. Um, but I found that very encouraging, very wide ranging. And I'm very grateful to all the all the speakers who joined us. Um, thanks very much. I think I think that's enough for me for now. Thank you. Thank you, and Bishop Nolan. Thank you so much for leading that section, uh, the plenary section of uh, our discussion today. And best wishes and prayers in your new role as Archbishop of Glasgow. Has it sunk in yet? It's, it is sinking in, yes, but it's still two weeks away. So, <laughs> best wishes. Uh, we've come to the end of the event, so I'd like to ask Bishop John Keenan of Paisley Diocese to offer his concluding remarks. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to everyone. Um, just to say I'm glad to offer some concluding remarks to today's gathering. Uh, our English teacher at school always advised us that conclusion is not a summary of what's already been said, but tries to highlight some deductions or inferences that can be taken away as a result of the discussion. So I'll try to sum up in that way. The scriptures surely offer us much for mapping out the path of a synodal journey. We've heard some of those. That said, I think it'd be difficult to find a better place to start than the Easter Sunday afternoon journey of the two Emmaus disciples. As that story emerges, we find the courage of the disciples to speak from the heart but also an openness to listen. And at the same time, a docility on Christ's part to listen to everything they had said and a courage to, to teach them. In the end, that synodal journey led to an authentic development. It was a journey in which um, the people of God represented by the disciples didn't have their views confirmed, but converted into something much better and much more wonderful. Um, Luke begins uh, his gospel account telling us how two disciples were making their way together from Jerusalem to Emmaus, making their way together, or synoding, if that's a word yet. And soon the journey of the disciples together also becomes a journey together with the risen Lord, even though at first they don't notice it. The Lord asks them what matters they're discussing along the way. They have been discussing, in all honesty, dark things. And they've been discussing them apart from Peter and the community in Jerusalem, whom they have for some reason left and departed. But as far as the Lord is concerned, if they're discussing these things anyway, as disciples apart from Peter, they might as well discuss them openly with him and maybe find that a more fruitful context. Importantly, Jesus lets them set the agenda. He doesn't give them topics for discussion. He doesn't immediately begin a teaching. He allows the discussion to begin on their terms, which they find spontaneously by speaking about what's in their minds and in their hearts as the questions of their day. Interestingly, the Emmaus disciples are not identified into clergy or religious or laity, in that respect, they represent all of us, the whole people of God. But anyway, because Jesus allows them to set the agenda, he allows them to tell their tale of misery, as it were. And what emerges is they ha have in their possession the whole of the gospel. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry among the people, where he showed himself a true prophet, and all the way through his passion and even to his resurrection, of the women who amazed them as to how they were at the tomb early in the morning but didn't find his body, surprisingly, and instead saw a vision of angels who said he was alive. 
and then their companions who went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. The point is, they had all the facts, all the data to hand. They were in possession of the fullness of the good news, at least materially. All they lacked was the interpretive key and the personal experience of the risen Lord to transform that same reality in their hands from despair into glory. Jesus' part on their synodal path is simply to supply the interpretive key and the personal experience. Jesus ensures in the end harmony will result, even though it was not without tension. And often we find this in the gospel at Cana, tension between Jesus and Mary. They're good enough to let us see it. They're good enough to let it unfold before our eyes. But they show how tension is resolved into harmony. Mary do what he says, Jesus doing as Our Lady had requested, making space for each other, allowances for each other. Uh, Jesus begins with a friend, friendly admonition for them. It's not enough to have data. Of itself, this will only offer confusion and conflict and sadness. Human constructions are not enough. Political paradigms lead nowhere. They need to come on the journey with faith. And faith means docility and openness to conversion and to correction even. And it is the perennial faith of their fathers beginning from Moses and the prophets. It has a substance or logic which we call the Paschal Mystery. The Paschal Mystery is always the way and our synod will embrace the Paschal Mystery if each of us is prepared to sacrifice something of the way we see things till now and be open to a new way that leads to life. The Paschal Mystery then interprets what seemed a material setback for God's covenant with us, but interprets it the Paschal Mystery, not as a sign of defeat, uh, but more fully and more correctly as an opportunity to embrace, to embrace the redemptive suffering that's necessary in the journey to resurrection glory. In the light of the Paschal Mystery and its wider and more complete interpretation of all that's just happened, everything that had been till now for the Emmaus disciples all skew with, now perfectly and marvellously and surprisingly falls into place. The synodal way began with competing interpretations, the interpretation of the disciples, the interpretation of Christ, in which Christ's interpretation won the day. If the Lord's teaching had wonderfully rekindled their faith, the recognition of his living and risen presence among them further galvanised them into a missionary impulse, immediately to return to Peter and to the others and to share their own new experience and understanding. They're no longer on the wrong path, going in the wrong direction away from Jerusalem. Now they're on the right path towards a new communion with Peter, where they are allowed a full participation by the means of sharing their story and their faith and all towards a fresh mission to spread the good news, first among the brethren and then in the world. Thank you. Thanks to all our participants today for taking part in this national event from the Bishops Conference of Scotland. Cardinal Mario Craig, Dr Sarah Parvis, Sister Catherine Drost, Father Guy Mancini, Dr Ed Morgan, Sister Anna Marie McGuan, along with our bishops, Bishop Hugh Gilbert, Archbishop Cushley, Bishop William Nolan, and Bishop John Keenan. Our bishops want your feedback on this event. Tell us what struck you, what your vision is for a synodal church in Scotland, or even what you disagreed with. The Bishops' Conference of Scotland will read all the comments, and these will form part of the feedback in the synodal process. We will also ensure that submitted questions for this event are included in that. This event will remain on YouTube, so you can go back and rewatch certain parts if you wish. The official Synod website is synod.va, that's synod.va, and you can find out more about Synod events locally from your parish or diocese. That's all we've got times for, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye.